start with net zero. What does that refer to? Well, net zero refers to uh, the Paris Agreement, the, 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 the COP in Paris from several years ago, where countries agreed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And what that meant was that they would reduce emissions, or it's supposed to mean, that they would reduce emissions as close to zero as possible. And then any remaining emissions uh, would be absorbed uh, from the atmosphere. Now, how much would be remaining and how that would be absorbed is not defined. And certainly at this point, uh, you know, the, the, the technologies that are being talked about and stuff are definitely not proven. Um, but there was that. And then um, it was also not discussed as like, you know, if there are some emissions, well, what are those emissions for? Of course, you'd only want those to be for the most essential, essential uh, services or, uh, or needs of, uh, to fulfill the most basic needs of, of, of people. But the corporations have really used that as a, a, an open door to come forward with their own idea of net zero. So in the, after the Paris Agreement, there was this rush of net zero plans that corporations were proposing, including corporations like Nestle from the uh, food and agribusiness sector. And of course, all of these are voluntary. So they're not held to any kind of particular standard and they're not really, you know, there's, no, there's no enforcement mechanism. Um, and if you look at these, uh, these net zero plans, one of the defining aspects of them is that almost all of the corporations, at least in the ones that I've looked at, certainly from the food and agribusiness sector, are all based on actually increasing the sales of their uh, highly emitting products. Um, you know, and that's even the case with, with energy companies. And then as a way to uh, get to that sort of net zero, which they're, they're claiming that they'll be able to do, they are relying heavily on offsets, what is called carbon offsets. So it's a, a meaning that they will invest in, or they'll purchase um, credits of uh, projects or technologies that are able to absorb uh, uh, carbon from the, uh, from the atmosphere. And an increasing amount of these sort of offset projects are based on land and forests. And the idea that if you say protect a forest from being deforested, uh, or you, and you plant trees, or you even engage in some kinds of uh, agricultural practices that are said to store carbon in the soil, that through that you, um, you if a company purchases or pays for that, then they can offset their own emissions. So really it becomes just this way for them to continue with, uh, with business as, as usual. And when we looked at the, um, the net zero plan for Nestle, uh, it was quite shocking. And you could see that they were, they were proposing that by 2030, so 2020 to 2030, they were gonna increase the, the sales of their meat and, and dairy and, and other highly emitting uh, products by two thirds over that period. And their plan for um, uh, offsetting these increased emissions was going to rely on uh, planting trees or zoning off uh, forests covering 4 million hectares per year. I mean, that's every year. So, I mean, it's completely unrealistic um, and has no, no, no sound scientific basis, but this was you know, one example of a, uh, a net zero plan that corporations are, are promoting. So when you looked at the net zero plan for Nestle, your research findings show that for Nestle to offset its emissions as proposed in this plan, they would have to plant trees on or zone off for conservation 4 million hectares of land per annum, so every year. And so it's not surprising that you would find this shocking because, as, as noted in the report, 4 million hectares is more than the size of the entire home country of Nestle, Switzerland. So the numbers don't add up. Yeah, no, once you get into details about the numbers, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I, 
you know, it, it doesn't hold any, any water at all. Companies are putting some money into this. So it's not just simple uh, rhetoric. You know, there are, there is a, a, in some millions or, or even in some cases, billions of dollars that are going towards these kinds of projects. And they're starting to have an impact on the ground because you have these companies who specialize in this, you know, who are taking over, say, areas uh, or territories um, that where you have Indigenous people and small farmers living and zoning them off and saying that they can no longer continue to practice their agriculture or their fishing or whatever it is in, in, those, in those territories because they've been sold off to any or to Total or whoever it is. Uh, so that they can get credits for their carbon credits uh, to keep on polluting. You know, this is something that is happening on the ground and communities are feeling the real impacts from this and we are seeing land grabs. How could all these companies be doing this? There isn't enough planet available to offset all their emissions. The fundamental thing that has to happen is they have to get to zero with their emissions and they know that they can't do that with their current model of production. And they're, in fact, even with their and when it comes to the food system, the, the, the ultimate problem here for corporations is that this solution doesn't involve them. You know, food sovereignty and agroecology do not allow for Nestle's or Cargill's or the Bayer Monsanto's to continue to make the kind of profits they're making now or any profits at all, frankly.